Holy Gospel according to St. John in the ninth chapter. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man who was blind from his birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who was it that sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. And he spread the mud onto the man's eyes saying to him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and washed, and he came back able to see. Now the neighbors and those who had seen him before, as he was a beggar, began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Now some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, but it is someone who looks like him. But the man kept saying, I am that man. And they began asking him, then how were your eyes open? And he answered, the man called Jesus made mud. He spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. And then I went and I washed and I received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. So they brought the Pharisees to the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. The Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and then I washed and now I see. Now some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he has not observed the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. They said again to the man who had been blind, What do you say about him? It was your eyes that he opened. The man who had been blind said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. And they asked him, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. Now his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. For the leaders had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out from the synagogue. Therefore his parents had said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called this man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that the man who healed you is a sinner. The man who had been blind answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And they said to him, What did he say to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I have told you this already. You would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Hearing this, they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man who had been healed answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from. 
and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. The leaders became angry and answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out of the community. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when Jesus found him, Jesus said to him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, Who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said to him, You have seen him. The one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. When I was younger, we got the newspaper each day. There were two things that I always turned to. Sports pages. See how the Browns were doing, and Buckeyes, and uh, during baseball season, looking at all the box scores, and checking out the batting averages and all the other things. Me and my brother would pore over those, especially on the weekends. And the other thing was the comics, especially Sundays, you know. Sundays meant the colored comic strips. Comic strips in full color with its own section all to itself. My favorite comic growing up was Garfield, the cat. I had a Garfield stuffed animal when I was a kid and probably bought about 10 or 12 of the collections of Garfield comic strips when I was younger. Garfield, uh, Garfield was famous for uh, being pretty selfish. Garfield, uh, if you're familiar with the comic strip, Garfield the cat uh, wanted people to feed him and then leave him alone. And that was pretty much it. And that was the gist of a lot of the comic strips. Didn't like the dog, didn't much care for his owner, didn't much care for anyone else either. There's one particular Garfield comic that I thought of as I was looking at the reading for this week. It was a comic strip where Garfield decided to turn the tables. Garfield decided to listen to and follow the urgings of the other people around him. Garfield was friendly to the dog. Garfield was friendly to his owner. Garfield couldn't get enough of being, of purring and being petted and doing kind things for everyone else in his life, which bewildered and terrified everyone else. The final box in the comic strip shows Garfield doing kind things and everyone else almost recoiling, going to the other side of the room in fear at what they were watching. And Garfield concludes, people don't want nice, people want consistency. Again, I thought of that comic strip as I looked at the people's reaction to Jesus' activity, to the incredible gift that this man born and blind has received in today's gospel. The title for our sermon today is metanoia. Metanoia coming from the Greek word. Metanoia 
meaning. Metanoia is the word from which we derive repentance. But the word metanoia, that is the root of repentance, literally means to turn one's heart, to turn one's life, to reorient a person's reality, to change our foundation, to change our center and our grounding in this world, which happens when we confess, when we seek absolution for our sins. But it also happens through out our experience of God, throughout our receiving of Christ into our lives, that transformation, that movement, that movement from living for self, from living for worldly pursuits, to living for God's reign and God's kingdom is metanoia. Changing, turning one's heart, altering one's reality. And the healing of this man The healing of this man brought that to his life. And like a stone that is dropped in a pond that sends out ripples, that transformation and that that change touched others as well. It went out to his family and his friends. It went out to the religious leaders. It went out to others who had known him. Now the man born blind is ecstatic about this change all that it brought to him, all that was now possible that wasn't before because he could see. But it's less clear how everyone else feels about it. In fact, all indications are that everyone else is guarded at best and offended at worst by what they're looking at here. Because not only has he been defined for a long time according to his blindness, But tangentially, those around him have adjusted to this as well. This should be viewed as a really great thing. But even his parents, his parents are distancing themselves from the good that has come to him. Because they don't want to give credit to Jesus, because they know that this could bring inconvenience and hardship to them. And it's possible that they're also a little reluctant and a little fearful at how this might change their relationship to their son. How their son might behave differently now that he is not completely dependent on them. How their son may not think of them in the same ways. The religious leaders give a passing word of thanks for this great thing, but then they proceed to their questions because all of this has direct consequences for them because if this man has been born blind it's understood as the disciples assume when they start this conversation with Jesus it's understood and assumed that he's blind because of some terrible sinning that went on and liberating people from sin was the business of the religious leaders and business was very, very good for them. And if this man can be liberated without the authority and power of the religious leaders being involved at all, then what else and who else might also be liberated without their help? How many times can these sorts of things occur before they're no longer as important and revered as they're accustomed to being? I mean, healings are all fine and good, but healings that are connected to sin and forgiveness, forgiveness of that sin, that, that's, that, that's their department. As Jesus is cutting in on their business. So they're not exactly happy with this miraculous gift either. Part of what we see happening in this chaos that follows Jesus' miracle is that tension, that tension between the religious leaders and the Christ that happens, and it happens often in the Gospels. It happens pretty much everywhere that the newly announced reign of God disrupts their understanding, disrupts their understanding of how things are supposed to work. And it's for this, 
It's for this that we hear Jesus calling them out. It's for this that we hear Jesus saying that they are the ones who are blind. Stating that their certainty, their stubborn claims to exclusive and ultimate truth, their refusal, their refusal to see God doing something right in front of their faces is the definition of blindness. But at stake here is, all, is not only are you with Jesus or against Jesus, also at stake in those who are truly seeing or truly not. At stake is those who see hope in the midst of of startling and dramatic change in those who cannot. Those who see potential for good, even in something that's strange and unusual, even in something that's hard to process, and those who aren't. Those who are excited or glad for God doing a new thing versus those who are threatened or offended by it. These are the contrasts that we see in today's gospel. And these are the contrasts that we see in terms of orientations that we can have towards our world, even towards our families. Parents, as parents, we want to raise our children with the empathy and the work ethic and the patience and the perseverance and the resilience, and the wisdom, and all of the skills that they need to go pursue whatever wild and wonderful dreams and goals they have. That's the dream. That's the goal. But occasionally, occasionally that goal goes way outside of what we're anticipating, way outside of what we're expecting. And that can be a tough pill to swallow. Likewise, our God is full of those sorts of surprises for us too. And can we be ready? Can we follow in faith? Can we follow in faith when it takes us where we do not expect it to? Can we follow in faith where it takes us outside of the norm, outside of the boxes and the ordering of things that we've had for our world? There's an old line from the TV show MASH. Major Frank Burns, who was always a stickler for order and details and military precision, he's demanding in this episode that everybody be uniform in their behavior. That everyone follow the same routine. That everyone, you know, kind of eat in the same way and do their tasks in the same way. And one of the other people in the cast says, Frank, what about individuality? And Frank says, individuality is great, as long as we're all doing it together. <laughs> that, that, that innate desire, that urging to put everything into a perfectly orderly path. God has a way of surprising us when we try to do those things. God has a way of showing us things that we're not always ready to see. George Carlin had a performance years ago where he was talking about ideas that he had for new inventions. One of the ideas that he had was for a light that shined only on things worth looking at. And then he thought, ah, well, it's a little too idealistic, a little too abstract. That'd never work. Jesus heals a man with physical blindness here. But he's less than effective in bringing remedy to the spiritual blindness that he witnesses from others. The blindness of denying new hope, new truth, because it doesn't flow. The blindness of missing out on a moment to rejoice at the glory of God. People who are living as if they're guided by a light that only shines on what they think is worth looking at. Most of the people in today's gospel will not see, cannot see that which is bringing God's glory into the world. St. Paul speaks of the cross in that way. He speaks of the cross as being a stumbling block, foolishness to many. 
His words probably understate things, really, to many. (laughs) It's a bit more than that. To many, it's insanity. God comes near in a nonviolent human being and absorbs the cruelty of this world and retaliates only with love and forgiveness? It's nonsense to so many people. God pours himself out and would rather and would rather suffer than sink to our level of blood and vengeance? It's inconceivable. God brings a table with room enough for Jews and Romans. God makes a home, not in the cold, dead stone of the temple, but in warm, living, beating hearts and lives. It's madness. Such is the blindness that still persists in this world. Such is the blindness that the gospel still confronts in this world. Blindness that's opposed to transformation, to repentance, to metanoia. But it's a blindness that the way of the cross keeps relentlessly pursuing. It's a blindness that God, through his church, through his body in the world, keeps going after like a hound on a hunt. And our Lord will never cease shining light to redeem the world. So may we live our lives with sight, not just for what's lovely and easy, comfortable, but for the things that are unsettling as well. May we live our lives with sight that looks for reflections of our Creator's spark and creativity and truth in every place and in every person. May we see with a vision that's larger than our own imaginations. Vision of the kingdom that has claimed us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.